Welcome again to the Comic Book Historians Podcast. Today we're proud to have Tom Orzachowski, letterer of the X-Men comics during the Chris Claremont run for the most part, as well as pretty much every single issue of Spawn Comics with Todd McFarlane. Welcome, Tom. How are you doing today? Oh, after all this time communicating with you guys on uh, the webpage, it's great to finally get some voices. It's a real treat for us too, Tom. When you were a kid, did you want to be a letterer, or what did you want to do in comics? When I was about 14, I figured I wanted to draw for comics. I started reading when I was about five, if you can call that reading, but it probably was. My um, reading comprehension is usually about three years ahead of myself, all during elementary school, ahead of my uh, my classmates. Uh, and I could spell kryptonite before I could spell a whole lot of anything else, and it was just that kind of a thing. Uh, but around age 14 or so, I guess when a lot of people have stopped drawing, I was still kind of doodling, and I figured, I could do this, couldn't I? And when I was 15, I was at a, what was, I think, the third comics convention in the Detroit area, which is 1968. I didn't just say that. And I met Arvell Jones, well, the most notable name in that group, penciled comics not long after I started lettering them. But... It, within this comics club, which is what it was, the Fantasy Fans Comic Collectors Group, and Arvell was the, the nucleus. He was like the the alpha male in the group, even at that age. He was the leader. People followed him. People joined in with him on his projects. I realized really quickly, once meeting like Rich Buckler, who was like a 34-year-old or kind of adjunct to this club, and then Starlin, and then Milgram, and then Mike Vosberg, everyone a few years older. I, mean, I can't ink. I mean... Milgram can ink, and Terry Austin trying to figure, I can't do what Terry does. This is ridiculous. But uh, as they were writing their own comic strips, uh, I could spell better than they could because I was taking journalism in high school. Penmanship was never really my strong suit, but I wanted to be part of what was going on. And so I was editing the scripts, which were kind of less considered than the illustrations by these guys. And so, yeah, I just took it upon myself without really being asked to edit the script so I was lettering because nobody wanted a letter. And, oh gosh, by the time I was about 17 or so, you know, having met Buckler, he was studying our scripts from Warren. And Stalin started penciling for John Romita about a year later. And it's like, clearly there was a movement, a possibility of getting foot into the door at DC or Marvel or Warren. And so when I was 16, I started going to New York for conventions there and taking lettering samples and go to Marvel because that was the place to be, go to Marvel. And I never really was able to walk into the office, which looked like it was just a, a tiny back office of a warehouse or something, just cardboard partitions and not a whole lot of people in there. And the guy would come out and give me a couple of pages of, like, Artie Simic's lettering on top of Selva Simmons' pencils on Captain America, that kind of thing. And so I'd had model sheets in that effect. And I'd met Tony Isabella by this time in the zines, maybe at a convention or two in New York. And when he got uh, an editorial job at Marvel late in 73, like toward October that year, pardon me, 72, when they needed someone to do the least appreciated job in lettering corrections. Uh, he called me the day after Christmas at my job and said, look, if you get here inside of two weeks, there's a desk you can work at in the office. So I was there a week later, January 2nd. So in about a month, it'll be my 45th year. And yeah, I was doing lettering corrections on the British reprints of the first decade of, well, the first couple of years of Marvel, 62, 63, for the British trade, which was thrilling because I bought those books and now I'm working on them just a few years later. And that just led to getting a little more skill, a little more skill. And within about five months, I was lettering some color comics. About how many uh, U's do you think you had to add to uh, the words in those British comics? Oh, God, countless. Yeah. <laughs> respelling the word check, respelling the word curb, which is K-E-R-B. Uh, Tony invented, because, you know, Thor and Iron Man and Ant-Man were all fighting communists, and, well, that wasn't really happening in 1973 anymore. And the Brits didn't care about the communist threat the way the Americans were kind of steamrolled into it. So Tony came up with, it might have been Roy, I think it was Tony, Cabo Davia, 
was the uh, oppressive other world nation. And so a different insignia had to be put on the tails of the airplanes and the uniforms. And the word Bordavia had to be substituted for communist whenever we saw like the Black Widow or anyone like this showing up in the pages. <laughs> so there were you know, lots of little tweaks. And, you know, do them a thousand times and you kind of remember them. And so when I was later in Chris Claremont's X-Men scripts a couple of years later, I met Chris in 73 also, when he was just one of the proofreader guys. Chris's parents were both British, and I think he was, I think he spent his first five months in the UK, and then they moved to the States. And he learned all the British spellings in those first five months of his life, and we're still putting them in his scripts. And so part of my unofficial job was to simply put those into US spellings. And I knew more British spellings than anyone else. So, yeah, that was, you know, just a, a heaven-sent oppor- opportunity for me. I just, I knew the job just from having corrected people. Nice. So there was actually a British connection almost, a UK connection between you and Chris Claremont. That's fascinating. That's interesting. And one other thing, which I won't name a name here because it's maybe a little too embarrassing after all this time. One guy I knew in the in Motor City days and I was lettering his zine work. Uh, then when I got into the office, he kind of finessed me into lettering his book. And one time he misspelled the word strength four times, four different spellings of the word strength in the same issue. <laughs> and I felt, well, okay, I can correct these. That's fine. And I did some minor tweaks and some of the captions and dialogue and stuff. And then Roy pulled me aside and said, you know, we really don't pay to do any editing. We just, you know, we're paid a letter. And so we'll take care of the editing. So, okay, I guess my fan days are truly over if I can't just kind of take liberties anymore. One of the first comics I ever saw you letter for, and it still stands out in my mind, is, and I can't remember the number. You're going to have to help me if you can remember, but I believe it was Captain Marvel 33? My first was 28. Jim's first was 24, so I was installed almost immediately. I remember noticing that you were the only letterer who did things to TV standards, like you would use a lettering that was similar to Star Trek, or you would use a lettering similar to TV logos I'd seen. And it's it's almost like you were bringing popular culture of full circle with your lettering. I don't remember anyone else doing that, and I believe that's one of your strengths. Do you want to comment on that? Fanboy comes to mind, because, you know, Star Trek was the deal after all, wasn't it? It had been off the air for two or three years by this time, but it was just etched into my retinas. The lettering style I used for the title, that was just unbelievable to me. It looked so futuristic and sleek, and I don't know where it came from. I haven't seen anything similar in any type books from that time. Uh, so one, I guess, was just clever and did something, you know, moderately interesting and futuristic, as if someone figured, you know, this show should have legs in it. Let's give it a little bit of extra goosing, make it a little more memorable than it would be otherwise. Tom, can we go back to the fanzine stuff for just a couple of minutes? I was curious, did you ever have any communications with Frederick Wortham? I did. That was kind of unexpected. Um, it must have been, and it, it's amazing, this slipped our mind for decades. But then Wortham hasn't been a topic in the last, like, you know, 35 years, the way he was when I was doing zines in the late 60s, when The Seduction of the Innocent was only like a 15-year-old book. Around 70, 71, 72, he did a book, and I can't recall the title of it. I'm sure one of you guys knows it. A Guide to Fanzines, something like that? Maybe that was it. I've never seen a copy. I've never read it. Um, yeah, Seduction of the Innocent was in my public library. I read it. I guess all of us did around 1968, 1969, when zines were starting to be everywhere. Uh, he couldn't go to a convention without seeing tables full of guys selling their zines by then. Supposedly, Seduction of the Innocent was ghostwritten. I don't know the name of the ghost writer. I'm sure he compiled notes, but English was not his first language. And I'm sure someone over the stuff and organized it and finessed it a bit. Um, he wrote kind of a love letter to fanzine publishers in the early 70s because all of his worst pre- um, fears and prognostications, prognostications did not come to pass. We did not become, you know, a generation of psychopaths and rapists and so on. You know, leather jacketed hoodlums. Most of us didn't. And so he he probably went through an issue of, like, Rockets Blast Comic Collector or Comics Buyer's Guide and just simply sent, you know, 25 cents, 50 cents in coin in an envelope to, like, a hundred, a thousand fancy publishers and just got copies of everything and went through them. And just all this fan artwork, you know, Steve Fabian and Rich Buckler and all these guys are just 
with their Edgar Rice Burroughs aspirations and their, you know, Steve Ditko aspirations. And there's no sign of criminality. There's no sign of, like, uncontrolled aggression or anywhere in anything that people are writing. It's just, you know, the zines are all love letters to the comic book editors and publishers and, and creative people. And it really changed his... He had to re-examine his own um, um, preconceptions 15 years earlier. And so he quoted me for like a sentence or two. And I probably was one of hundreds who were quoted for a sentence or two. But yeah, there's one of my footnotes in the history of comics is that Frederick Wortham quoted me in one of his books. I read the book six weeks ago and I found that paragraph and posted it. I was delightfully surprised. I was like, hey, Tom Wojciechowski. And so it was cool to get your feedback on that. That was really great. Yeah, he was uh, just this, you know, genial fellow. It was just, I think we had like a letter or two back and forth and asked me, you know, well, why is it you hate comic books so much? He says, no, it wasn't the comic books as such, as a form. It was just the criminality, or, you know, the exaggerations of the Charles Viro books, the EC comics from the first part of the 50s. And that went away pretty quickly. And it never resurfaced. Even when Joe Orlando was editing the House of Secrets and those books for DC toward uh, like 1970, 1975, whenever that was, it was a pretty soft version of the EC books. You know, it's a sensual script, but you didn't have people beheading their wives or anything like this anymore. I don't know, in a post-war kind of commie, you know, red scare kind of society, maybe that was not the most irrational thing to have published. I don't know. It's it's too late to try to analyze it now. It's you know, it's seventy five years ago almost. Well, my grandmother debated him uh, in the late sixties, early seventies, and my grandmother was a big proponent of comic books as a reading teacher. It seems as though he backed down quite a bit on a lot of the things he had said in the fifties because he said a lot of the same things you're mentioning that kids didn't become psycho killers. Batman and Robin did not lead a lot of kids it wouldn't be homosexual to homosexuality and those kind of things it does seem like he backed down quite a bit so in his older years that he realized he might have been completely mistaken in some respects well how nice and if i contributed in a small way then okay yeah to his enlightenment just food for thought how much do you feel the comics code change the trajectory of the way kids reacted to comic books do you feel like that played a role in guiding them away from potential bad behavior or it made no difference i don't think kids who were spending their dimes on comic books instead of cigarettes were ever going to be any kind of a threat to tell you the truth and also trends in comics at that time until you had the the big marvel revolution well let's say the silver age revolution from about 1958, 1960 and onward, comics were just changing every few years. The whole superhero thing changed so quickly. You know, even it even modified itself as the talent became more experienced and new people like Hubert and Gil Kane came in to the 40s. The late 40s looked read nothing, looked nothing like the early 40s. And early 50s comics looked nothing like late 50s comics. The, the themes, you know, westerns came and went. Romance comics were less sensationalistic as time went on. The, I think seduction may have had an effect, but comics just change. You know, interests, you know, different media come in, TV comes in, westerns come in, B-movies, you know, drive-in movies come in. So people look for different things in comics, or used to, every few years. So I think there would have been a change away from EC and crime comics anyway. You know, if you read, like, eight issues of Tales from the Crypt, or, you know, that whole set of EC horror books... Marvel's monster books, the Atlas monster books from the later 50s, the Kirby, Ditko, Don Heck ones, you read three or four of them and you've read them all. They just didn't have that many themes. And so I don't know if Jack Davis and Al Feldstein and that gang, Graham Ingalls, would have gotten kind of bored anyway if readership wouldn't have been falling off. Maybe it had been. As, you know, like, well, the new trend books, unfortunately, didn't do any business at all, and those are the best of them. Johnny Craig, Al Williamson, you know, an entirely different focus then the face is high. Yeah, some of those are just yeah. fantastic. Fabulous. And you can get, pick them up for a song. You can make them for like $10, $15, if, and if you don't mind battered condition copies. It's the Kurtzman of- books for me. The two war tales. Those are the ones that I love the most. Oh, you mean two fisted tales? Two fisted tales and frontline combat. Yeah, yeah. That those group of core fun. artists they had, that was just with Kurtzman controlling it tightly. I, I love those books. And I love the Kurtzman covers myself also. I thought his covers were some of the most explosive 
Although simplest in some respects, they were some of my favorites of all time. George Evans, who was fabulous, and um, Johnny Craig was fantastic. The historic ones that Wood was doing at that point, Massacre at Agincourt, those are just fantastic, too. But practical sense, you have to wonder, especially with Wally Wood and Johnny Craig, who was my favorite among all the EC artists, how they made a living doing that extent of detail, that extent of rendering and research. Because the budgets were good, but they couldn't have been good enough to justify Wally Wood going just, you know, crazy with the amount of science fiction or historical background he was doing or the, you know, the, even on the suspense type stories, the shock suspense story type things, just the background detail, the interior scenes, the draperies, the carpets. He must have been a pauper doing that kind of work. John Severin, too, on the war stuff. His were lovely as well. I'm curious, after EC Folds, did you become a Marvel person primarily, or were you always keeping DC and Marvel both in your pockets? My earliest comics came from cousins who were like four or five years older than I was. And so I'd see World's Finest in Action Comics and Strange Tales and just kind of the whole gamut of them. Because I started seeing like a lot of Atlas Monster comics and then like Fantastic Four number one just all in kind of one big load around 1960, 1961. And they were just so much more exciting. Like, I liked Strange Adventures and Mystery in Space better than Action Comics because I thought Supergirl was just <laughs> such a limp kind of a strip. She's just crying all the time. How old is she anyway? When she landed, she was about 14 or 15. Yeah, 15, something, yeah. But in order for her to be in love constantly with the, the horse guy or the merman guy, she had to have been like 17, 18. Still in the orphanage, but certainly no younger than 17. But she's just weeping constantly, and there's nothing interesting that she's doing as a super being. You know, like Superman pushing planets out of the orbit in their lead stories. And she's doing nothing but, like, adopting a cat. <laughs> well, there's Groot. You know, there's tree monsters and spider monsters, and DC had nothing to compare with that. Strange Adventures was okay, and I liked those a lot. But DC was like cool jazz and Marvel was rockabilly. And this Kirby guy, this Ditko guy, these people are crazy. And Infantino was laid back and Murphy Anderson was, you know, meticulous. He was like your good uncle. But Ditko and Kirby, they were like the guys mowing the lawn across the street. <laughs> yeah, and the Ditko stuff was so creepy at the time. What really turned me into a Marvel fan early on and still to this day, his work to me there at Marvel and Charlton is some of the absolutely most atmospheric fright fests that I can think of in comics. And he's still to this day has a huge impact on me. Yeah, he brought that that emotional, that, um, yeah, emotionalism, I guess would be the word that Kurt Spinner was giving those covers. Ditko is, I mean, when he was drawing scientists or like jungle explorers or stuff, or uh, Jonah Jameson, no one was designing characters like he was. These people were out of their minds. They were such zealots. He was unique. Ditko was, is unique. Yeah, that's a really good point. Marvel really did, one of the things that made a major impact in terms of their success was those supporting characters, that DC didn't have anything beyond the girlfriends, except for maybe Superman and Batman had a few, but like J. Jonah Jameson was something different. I think, yeah, the, uh, Stephen Grant talked about this. He and I had some conversations about that kind of thing. He thinks that Ditko was clearly plotting Spider-Man by issue 10 when Jonah had that final page where he just lays his heart on the line, you know, why do I hate Spider-Man? You know, Stan would not have plotted that. I think the entire kind of Jack Davis quality of the cartoon, the Bigfoot quality that Ditko brought to things was unparalleled. I find, in fact, that like the John Romita of Spider-Man and then um, Gil and then Ross Andrew, these are like fiction. And it's like Ditko's were the only true Spider-Man issues. Wow, yeah. So about how old were you, Tom, when you were reading those? And and I have a reason for asking this. Well, I was born in 53. So at FF1, I was 8 in 19, or 8 or 9 in 1961. You know, I was exactly the right age, the target age, 8, 9, 10 years old, when all these books were debuting, Ant-Man and Iron Man, these things, I was about 10. I was born in 59. When I was 12, that's when you started in on things like Jungle Action 
and Captain Marvel. And those were mine that just knocked me out of my seat. You were part of what my favorite Marvel era was, even though I love that other stuff in the Ditko and Kirby. But when Gerber and Englehart, McGregor and those guys were working, that was just it for me. And you were part of that. So can we talk about that a little bit? Just as a fanboy myself, I want to hear when you started on things like Jungle Action, did you realize what a game changer difference that was from anything that had preceded it oh yeah i mean that moment well like that three-year moment was just explosive from the first year from conan which i guess is officially where the bronze age began when suddenly marvel turned a corner and roy's instincts plus you know the things i licensed doc savage conan planet of the apes and the decision to expand the line because they suddenly had distribution so any any backup character you know man wolf for pity's sake Everything got its own title for like two or three or six issues just to see if it would stick. And Tomb of Dracula stuck. And Kill Raven, well, maybe two years of Kill Raven, maybe two years of Jungle Action with the Panther. But McGregor and Starlin and Gerber, I mean, passion just oozing out of their pores. I'm just now reading, in fact, the, um, the Marvel, uh, what's it called? Essential of the Black Panther, the Jungle Action issues. And, Don kind of went on a bit, but once he gets to the rhythm, as you know, the same could be said about Chris Claremont, once he gets to the rhythm of their speech and the character nuances and the character, well, I mean, Chris's own eccentricities, Don's own eccentricities, like in the way Don named his villains, Killmonger? You know, what's Eric Killmonger supposed to be? <laughs> well, that's all passion. Yeah. And Tate and Kazibi, the two kind of, uh, the kind of Abbott and Costello, you know, followers of, of Kill Raven who were always kind of getting knocked on their butts by, by T'Challa every issue. Don was just so deeply into the emotional relationships. He brought, uh, an American woman, uh, his lover with him back. Monica to, Lynn. Yeah, Monica Lynn. Yeah. And everyone is slagging her constantly. The tribal women say, who is this woman? Why doesn't he find someone here? Who can be his peer and his mate? Why did he import this, this hoity toity, you know, American woman who just doesn't know a thing about the, who we are, doesn't belong here? And they were given her grief every single issue. She was trying to bear up under it. That was, you know, that was phenomenal. That was amazing. And my own particular Marvel experience in 73 was I just couldn't bear to live in New York. Inside of seven months, I split for the West Coast where I had another opportunity piling up. So I led only four issues of jungle action. Is this but, where you got into underground comics, Tom? Well, I was reading those. I think it was at Buckler's Place in 68 that I saw Zap number one. What is this thing? This is like, I, I, I'd never seen anything like that. I wasn't, I guess I was familiar with Betty Boop cartoons, Pop, the older Popeye cartoons. So I was kind of vaguely aware of the stylistic things that Chrome was playing off of. But Zap was just clearly out of his, le- his, Right brain, left brain, whatever you call it. There was no filters. It was just pure and unadulterated nonsense of the grandest sort. And it changed my perception of comics and of lettering for all time because he was basing his work in the 20s, which I had no exposure to at that time. I was only like 17, 18 years old. And so as first opportunity I had when I was in my first couple years professionally, I started seeking out old books of graphic arts and seeing what was going on in the 20s and jazz records and the recording business, sheet music, things that Crumb was just overwhelmed with. Wow. So, you know, the Star Trek thing you mentioned, then Robert Crumb and Undergrounds, which I'd already read a lot of by the time I started at Marvel. Roy pulled me aside one day when I was still doing, okay, this is getting convoluted, working on Monsters Unleashed and Tales of the Zombie and this kind of thing, Vampire Tales the Vinnie Marvel Black and Whites in 72, 73. I was doing new titles for the 50s reprints to make them a little more contemporary looking. And Roy told me my titles are too much like underground comics. I figured, cool. I've learned something. (laughs) I've achieved something. And he didn't like the look of it, so I kind of tried to look a little more like Marvel. But once I got to the West Coast and was doing... You know, like Werewolf by Night, and then after a couple of years, X-Men, I figured, these are tied to the Marvel Universe. I can do anything I want. And so, yeah, so doing a Savage Side of Conan, I was trying to work more on the Art Nouveau approach that Barry was bringing to some of the titles he did on the Conan color book when he was still doing that. And on X-Men, I developed a couple of kind of quirky things that I probably overdid 
just because I didn't, it didn't have to look like Fantastic Four. It didn't have to look like, you know, Marvel mainstream. So yeah, the underground comics were quite an influence on me because they were just, and likewise, Don McGregor, likewise, Jim Starlin were like the mainstream exponents of the same thing. It was just heart and soul, just out there on the page, no filters. It was very amazing. We knew that we were doing something different. It was the new generation of Marvel, only 10 years after the first generation of Marvel. And you also had things like Star Reach, which was kind of a combination of more the Marvel style, but in, with an underground approach and things like that during the right. same period. So Mike Friedrich, first scripting for Julie Schwartz on, I think, Detective Comics on Batman when he was 19. Actually, Mike's first sale to DC was Spectre number three, which Neil drew, and then an issue of Lantern, which was drawn by Gil Kane, a retelling of the Detective number 27 story drawn by Bob Brown. So Mike was like rolling high. Mike was just, you know, top of the game. But after a couple of years, he petered out. So he was writing Justice League. They weren't that impressed by it. And then there was, for some reason, a break with DC. He went to Marvel. And his writing just wasn't holding up. He didn't seem to have anything new to bring to it. And he saw that this was clearly deteriorating. And so he created the Star Reach comic, which would be creator-owned. So midway, he called it ground level, not overground, not underground. And so creator ownership all the way which makes it kind of difficult to reprint this stuff now because some of his artists are dead. But he, in fact, he dangled this in front of myself, Engelhardt, Starlin, Alan Weiss, and Brunner to say, you know, I'm creating this new comics company out on the West Coast. You guys aren't from here in New York anyway. You know, why don't you move west? You know, you'll really dig the scene out there, as it were. And I came along also, and so we lived all together for a while and then went our separate ways after a year or so. But I stayed with Star Reach and Frank did for a while. And that was so cool. And yeah, Frank did own what he was doing and Jim owned what he was doing. And I think they gave everyone a lot of ideas. You know, we don't need to stick with the Marvel mainstream. Engelhart did because he was in the time of his life getting all the top books for that time. And it was a good opportunity for me because I didn't have, again, this gave me an opportunity to not work in the mainstream Marvel style. I never really did master that anyway. Danny Crespi, who lettered a lot of the Marvel covers after Rosen and Simic retired in the early 70s, Danny never once asked me to work more in the Marvel style. He saw that I knew what I was trying to do, and I was, you know, using good references and not just making up nonsense. I was actually getting good outcomes, I guess, if I can flatter myself. And so he just let me keep going my merry way. It was fun. It's, the comics has always been fun. That's, I think, the whole point of it. If all goes well, is you have fun with it. Was Epic Illustrated a big deal? Because you were part of that from the very beginning. Yes, I was. Yeah, uh, Starlin and I, yeah, after all, you know, we were fans together. And so when he had a new thing coming up, as often as not, he'd give me a call and see if I had the time to stick this. You know, so I did Metamorphosis Odyssey for Epic Magazine, and I lettered Craig Russell in Epic Magazine and a few people I'd known. Yeah, I started to letter Bill Sienkiewicz, but, well, you know, you can't stick with everything. There's only so many pages you can handle in a month. Yeah, that brings me to a question that's bugged me forever. Why didn't you get to do Death of Captain Marvel when you were so essential to to the entire run and to Warlock as well? Didn't I do Death of Captain Marvel? You're not credited for it. Is someone else credited? Was it Novak or something? You did Marvel Graphic Novel 2 through 4. Your name is associated with so many Starlin projects. The lettering is currently credited to Jim Novak for the Death of Captain Marvel. Then I guess it was Novak. Maybe I was just over busy at that month, and so Crespi assigned it to Novak. Because, you know, Jim and I were kind of acquainted, but we're never really friends, you could say, because he was a bit older. He'd been in the military already when I was just getting started. Like, the first Warlock that he did was lettered by Annette Kowecki, and then I did the half dozen or so that happened after that. Those and are the- crazy good. I love those Warlocks that he did. I think that's my favorite stuff of his. Let me ask you something, Tom, that I'm real curious about. Did you approach the graphic novels any differently than you had your regular comic work? Did you feel like it had to be elevated because the price point was much larger, it was on better paper, it was square bound, or did you just approach it the way you had the comics work before that? It was the same kind of gig as far as I was concerned. Longer, which meant, you know, a higher pay point, but... I just did the kind of work I was familiar with. As I was starting to say, Jim and I kind of, since we weren't that tight in the first place, once it came to the Dreadstar series for Epic, the Epic imprint, that went to Novak also. But Novak was like, you know, the best guy. He was the top of the stack. 
and I wouldn't say I was necessarily second tier, but you had Novak and uh, Sam Rosen, pardon me, Joe Rosen, because Sam had already died by then, doing, you know, Spider-Man, Fantastic Four, Thor, all the, the main line books. And I would get the side projects because my work was just that much more eccentric. Did but your also, star really rise with X-Men? Yeah, I guess you could say that. It was a lot of work. I mean, you know, a lot of regular work. Well, you got X-Men pretty early on. I mean, you didn't start your true run until a little later, but if I'm not mistaken, you uh, lettered X-Men 94, which was the first new regular issue of the regular title since it had been canceled years before and shortly after Giant Size X-Men 1 came out. Yeah, I don't think I'd seen Giant Size 1 because I was living in Berkeley at that time. And I was told later it was just a miraculous thing that uh, Verporten and then Danny kept sending me work on the West Coast because everyone else was kind of hugging the office all the time. Janice Chang, everyone was, you know, close to the office. You drop in once or twice so we can get a book and go home and do it. And they kept mailing things to me, which took days. There was no Federal Express then. It would take like three or four days for the book to cross the country. They keep sending me stuff out there. And I guess um, John would just, you know, grab whatever was on the top of the stack of books that weren't going to Costanza or Novak or Rosen and just give those out, you know, here and there in any direction because most books didn't have regular lettering, as lettering assignments at that time. I don't think I'd seen Giant Size yet when X-Men 94 arrived. Oh, I see. Was it a surprise to you when it became so popular so fast? It wasn't that popular that fast. Uh, Byrne was telling me that, you know, people assumed he was just, you know, a you know, megastar status, making millions of dollars in issue and royalties. But no, the book didn't sell that well, even toward the end of the Phoenix cycle. It was, you know, picking up incrementally month after month, building pretty solidly. But it wasn't yet the really big seller. So he was making money on the reprints later on. I like classic X-Men reprints of the later 80s, you're saying. Yeah, yeah. He made a good professional reputation on this. He could pretty well write his own ticket. But the book didn't sell that well. So when you saw X-Men 94, did you have the impression it was going to be that successful? Did it feel like, wow, this is impressive? Or was it more like, okay, this is a cool assignment. I'm going to letter it. What was your impression when you first saw those pages? What impressed me was it was Dave Cockrum, because I'd seen his Legion stuff for a few years. And holy smoke, who are these characters? You know, there's Charles and there's Scott and there's Gene and a few others. But it's like, wow, they're bringing this thing back. How cool is that? And it was energetic and nice. And that's about all I can, you know, it was pretty much my whole impression. It was, you know, meanwhile, I've got two or three days to do this thing. What was your impression of Dave Cockrum's creative input into the X-Men? Do you feel like he really revitalized it by bringing in that legion of superheroes energy into the comic book? The X-Men book, the worst selling of their books, and that's why they canceled it after only like, you know, five years, six years. And it seemed like they didn't truly know what to do with it. You know, Neil and Roy did some amazing things during the year or so they did it. And in fact, that's why it was revived, because the sales were perking up pretty noticeably during that time. The Stranko issues were fun to look at. It was kind of a flabby book overall. It just no one seemed to know what to do. So, you know, Warner Roth's issues didn't do that much magic, and so they then started doing different logos every issue to highlight the story to lines, and Tesco was drawing it for a while. But it seemed like an unnecessary team, mm -hmm. an unnecessary book in the line. And Dave and Chris put an urgency in there and Len that new characters, they really don't know what they're doing. There's, I don't know, maybe it's just the dynamic of the artwork. It's Cockrum was a star. His Legion issues did set, you know, that series on fire. It had been kind of just a, a bottom tier series when he suddenly installed and started redoing the costumes and Carrie Bates was writing it. And so there was a different aspect of the scripts. The Legionnaires, as drawn by Kurt Swan and John Fort and uh, then Wynn Mortimer, they didn't seem like they were teenagers. They were young adults. They were really at approximately 30 years old, just like everyone else. And Dave made them look younger and gave them style consciousness. They were kind of flirty. And he brought that energy into X-Men. And Chris was able to play on that real successfully because he had his kind of his theatrical background. He was he went to Bard College. Well, he was a young dramatic player. He was an actor. He was a drama major. All these things come together. But, yeah, certainly Dave's visuals were completely unexpected. 
John Byrne, his first X-Men issue was 108 with the Imperial Guard, and you lettered that issue. How did you feel about that transition from Dave Cockerham to John Byrne on the X-Men at the time, when you first saw those pages? The immediacy was different. Dave had a lot of close-ups, and John was doing a lot of middle shots and distance shots to show the whole team together at one time. He didn't start doing close-ups for a while. And they were skinnier. I felt he was a good successor artist because his style was reasonably polished. He was spotting a lot of heavy blacks. He wasn't afraid to draw anything. He was not shy. He was not just doing being sketchy. The pencils were very full and tight. And I knew Terry Austin, as I say. So having Terry on the book also, it's like, you know, wow, we're in business now. This is going to work. Nice. I didn't realize John started as early as 108, but I guess you're right. Yeah, I think he did one one away, and then he did one with Arcade and the Circus. I think you did that one as well. I'm glad you brought that up, because that is the first comic book that actually made me notice the letter. <laughs> it was all your fault, Tom. It's your fault, man. It's your fault. Because you brought this excitement of circus poster art to comics, and you did that quite often. Like, whatever it called for, you would go more sci-fi. Whenever it would call for it, you'd go more huckster. You made it bigger than life. And honestly, were the letter that made me realize lettering was an art form. It's calligraphy of a, a more casual sort. And I think that was 111, side to performers on the cover, a nice Cochrane cover. I've forgotten that was arcade, yeah. Uh, well, thank you. I moved to Berkeley when I was about 23, so just past college age. And it's all bookstores and cafes and, you know, like Ann Arbor or an actual college town and not just a place near a campus. And so I was just always living in Moe's books and Aardvark's books and Shakespeare's books, Shakespeare and Company, and I forget the name of the others, and just picking up graphic arts books by the armload. And, you know, posters from the 1910s and earlier and sign painting out of the 40s and just anything, anything I could find, calligraphy. And how do they come across these, these outcomes? How do they bring their layouts? So yeah, when it came down to issue 111 was, and I, I made the, the ornament on the letter S at the wrong angle, and so that haunts me to this day. It seemed like my duty to bring that kind of level of interest in there because, you know, by then I was, I'd done flyers for bars already and for bands. And, you know, let's, rather than just doing the same kind of title every issue the way, like they had in the EC books, or a lot of the Marvel books, you know, Civic and Rosen could put a lot of variety in there without a whole lot of trouble. But I figured, let's really go whole hog on this. Let's go crazy and make it look like it's been typed. So like like a graphic designer did this. And one of the bullpen guys kind of chewed me out one time years later when I was, you know, trying to make get people interested in um, different typography magazines and stuff, different uh, subscription things I was getting. He said, you know, look, you know, you're living in Berkeley. You get loaded all the time. You can spend all day working on one title to make 10 bucks. I got alimony to pay. I can't do that kind of nonsense. You should just shut up and lighten up and make some money. And he was right. I didn't take his advice, but he was right in giving it to me. But yeah, I, I did take pleasure in doing silly title work for Savage Sword that looked more myth and legend E or for Tarzan or for X-Men, handling these things differently for the title work anyway. I also noticed you used an awful lot of upper and lower case, which for your issue, first page titles, kind of puts you in a whole different class than the other guys. You were willing more to experiment and push the realm. I think to this day, those comics still kind of trumpet to me how great comics were in that era and i still think you had so much to do with that it's just amazing getting to talk to you about this period because i think it was so influential and so important to comics well thank you but as my credit pointed out i was spending you know hours to make ten dollars yeah i look at these things now and i say yeah that one came out okay that one worked out well but they don't look like marvel and so ultimately in the grander scheme of things if you appreciated it, if, you know, it made my work stand out from everyone else, then I suppose that was a good thing. I never did understand why no one else took up the challenge to do more elaborate title work. I guess they realized you can't make any money that way. And, you know, at the end of the month when you got to pay your bills, yeah, the money is important. That has to be a payment in and of itself. Like Arthur Adams' work, not so much the work he's doing now for individual, for private sales, which are, you know, rendered magnificently in all directions. When he was penciling those X-Men annuals and specials, oh, toward 1990, whenever that was, 
No one else was working on three-point perspectives in every single panel, but he was, because how could he not? He's Arthur Adams. And he employed more of an underground style at the time, too, because of all the pointillism, the odd things he was doing, as well as the perspective issues you were mentioning. And so I think he and Byrne both kind of opened up a new era to me of what it meant to be a penciler and what it meant to be a comic book artist. That stuff still stands out to me. And your lettering on it just pushed it that much further into the greatness realm for me. Well, imagine the position I was in, because I'd be opening packages every month, you know, original artwork, and then later on it was full-size Xerox copies, and I'd be working on overlays that would paste onto the artwork. I didn't know if I'd be getting Rick Leonardi or John Romita Jr. or Barry Smith, you know, Arthur, Craig Ross. I didn't know who would be drawing the book that month. It was by week for like the summer, so it'd be like maybe 16, 18 X-Men issues a year for a while. Just seeing that kind of variety of approaches on Kevin Nolan, Brett Levin, Steve Leloha, on the same characters, the same continuity, the same story continuity, but suddenly an entirely fresh, silly, crazy, personable style. You know, how could you not get juiced and have it influence your own work when suddenly there's an Eric Larson issue, a Tom McFarlane issue, just a Rob Liefeld issue, just it's a, a crazy life. It's it's a miraculous thing, a place to have been. I haven't heard you mention Paul Smith. How did you enjoy lettering to his version of the X Men? Oh, those were glorious. I mean, we we're talking about Burn a few minutes ago. But the big question was because Dave, wonderful man and wonderful illustrator, he could not do a monthly when he was drawing the Legion. I don't think they were full length, and maybe they were, and maybe that just got on his nerves after a while. I, I forget who was inking them. But when it was you know, clear he was not going to be able to continue X-Men, I thought, well, who's going to replace Dave? How can we possibly find anyone to continue after Dave? And then Byrne was in the wings, and there was some doubt whether he was ready yet. And then John stayed for about, what is it, about three years. And then, well, who's going to replace John? How can we possibly find anyone to replace John? And then Dave put his hand up and said, I can do that. So he lasted about a year, and then the monthly schedule was once again just more than he could stand. Who's going to replace Dave? And then Smitty showed up out of nowhere. I think he'd been an animator with Ralph Bakshi, actually. Yes. Which really loosened a person up. All that nutty stuff. <laughs> and his stuff was glorious. And he did less than a year. He did you know, either 10 or 11 issues. Was that it? Wow, it had such an impact on me. I would have said at least three years. That, that's amazing. Those are yeah. some fantastic issues. Beautiful, beautiful issues. I still look back at those. Yeah, wonderful covers. And Chris was on fire, so we got Road at that time. And they fought the, well, they essentially were on the Nostromo and fought the aliens at that time. And he was up for all of it. And so Storm got her mohawk at that time, which I think was Chris's idea. You know, it was really shake that up. And the fan mail was just, oh, 100% against it. What a horrible thing to do to Storm. Put her in leathers with studs <laughs> and a mohawk. What's wrong with you people? No cape. You know, with the Dark Phoenix Saga and Days of Future Past, were you enjoying the story as well when you would see it unfold in front of you? Oh, yeah, because there was no way of knowing what was going to happen next. You know, here's Jean in a corset and, you know, eight-inch heels and so on. It's like, and she's into it. Chris felt a remarkable freedom to completely throw out anything anyone would expect. You know, Sue Storm, you know, Ben Grimm, these people are always going to have the same relationships. You throw in Crystal occasionally to shake things up. It was only Byrne that re really shook up the Sue Storm thing later on. But Chris felt no loyalty at all to the old days. And he was under no editorial pressure, which is more to the point. Well, Jim Shooter by this time. Right. To in any way conform to the pre-existing X-Men. They figured, okay, this book is detached from its history, which made it unique. The others had to stay pretty close to their history. As I'm sure all three guys know that in Chris's original outcome, Gene was simply lobotomized to get the Phoenix out of there. Right. And Shooter said, well, no, she's broiled an entire planet of asparagus people. She has to die. You can't allow this to happen. That was already published. You can't take it back. So we have to kill her. And so we'd already finished that issue and gotten about a third or, or half away into the subsequent issue. So they pulled 137 and had the final chapter completely redone, and she did die. And 138 had basically Scott and Jean kind of walking through the grounds, because they were going to live in like a little shanty in the back of the, the mansion and kind of set up their life as a married couple. 
And they were reminiscing about the previous, you know, 150 issues, whatever it was. And well, no, then that became the X-Men at her grave site, reminiscing about the previous 150 issues. <laughs> but I still have Xerox as a lot of that issue where it's just Jean kind of looking kind of distant and like part of her brain is missing. And Scott's slowly realizing, you know, she's really not the Jean I fell in love with anymore. Oh, wow. And I hope we can get her back out of this post-traumatic shock, but there's no way of knowing. And I'm not sure where that plot point was actually going to go eventually because Chris had to throw it away. But he probably still has his notebooks, which I guess will be donated to the Columbia University Library, the Billy Ireland Library in Columbus at some point. The sound effects of Banff and Snicked, did you letter those? Well, yeah. Yeah, you did that, right? Yeah, I didn't create them, but yeah, those are Chris's scripts. And I. And then you'd write the Banff word in Nightcrawler's powder teleport. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> that's really great. I love that. The job of the letter involves the story titles on page one, the sound effects. Yeah, the artist doesn't do those for the most part. Occasionally an artist will do the sound effects of the story title. Well, mostly it's up to me or, you know, Novak or whomever. And then the captions. Yeah, we do the balloons. Those aren't drawn by the artist. And I love your explosion noises, by the way, when you would take over the entire bottom of a long panel and it'd be ba -ba -bam, or whatever. I mean, can't think of the exact. And the way you would make it almost quake, I could hear those sound effects in my head more so than I ever could in comics. And I, I still think about that stuff in my dreams. And uh, when I, <laughs> so I loved how you crack a bone or, you know, <laughs> uh -huh. I haunt your dreams. Yeah. Yes, you're haunting my dreams. Get out of my dreams, Tom. You're in our dreams. As far as a letterer, Here's a controversial question, not too controversial, but Artie Simic, you've said, was an influence on you. Is that correct? Oh, sure, yeah. The night Gwen Stacy died, that amazing Spider-Man, when Spidey catches Gwen falling off the bridge, and her head swings back, and then there's a lettered sound of her neck snapping. Do you remember that? Uh, vaguely, yeah. Do you feel that neck snapping, does that confirm that it was Spider-Man as the cause of Gwen Stacy's death? Okay, here comes the hate mail. <laughs> the origin of this, and this gets kind of conflicted, but I was, I knew Conway when I got there. Like, among the final books I bought before I knew I'd be working in the office was what, Amazing 124 and Conan 24, the, the final Barry Smith issue. Uh, so I remember that panel. I remember the situation. I was like, what? <laughs> but Stan, and I mean, this has gotten kind of scrambled over the years as, you know, Stan remembers things one way and then remembers them another thing because life was so busy. You know, he wasn't keeping notes. But that the relationship between Peter and Gwen, and they were still about like 20 or 21 years old in continuity, had gotten so intense and dramatic and, you know, lovingly rendered by Ramita, the romance artist, for like, you know, four years or something. Either they'd be getting married or she'd have to die. There'd be no way to just end the romance, just kind of let it drift away somehow. And they were too young. There would be too massive a change in the scenario if they were to be married, because that would change the framework of the series too much. And Parker is the bad luck kid, after all. They kind of abandoned a lot of that in the Ramita days to our Ditko's issues. Like every fourth page, something would go wrong. <laughs> Aunt Mays had a stroke for the 12th time this month. He can't afford the medication, and she's in the hospital. And Betty Brandt just slapped his face. And what was Betty, who must have been, I mean, she was an executive secretary. Why was she hanging out with a 16-year-old photographer? Yeah, that was so wrong. That's true. Huh. That would be in the headlines today. Yeah, they had problems with the age relationships. Because, you know, Stan was a romance writer. That was the entire shtick of the Marvel age was that he was taking romance comics for the next level and giving them powers and costumes. Uh, but as far as the Gwen Stacy things go, the goblin pushed her off the edge. Yes. His intention was that she die, or that Spidey be distracted. Spidey had a second to react. And so, yes, he swung and, and caught her, but he didn't have time to plot the trajectories and consider what would happen in G-forces and things you guys can probably name easier than I can. Yeah, the act of catching her did things to the physical body which she could not bear. She could not have survived. But he had that pushed her. It was a moment you can't do over. There's no going back. He saw her fall, and he saved her. Clark saved Lois, you know, hundreds of times in that way. And she never felt any ill effects. She never dropped her notepad or her pencil. Her hat never fell off. So, 
you know, goblin, you bastard. You may be complicit in her death. But unfortunately, Peter was because he didn't have the time to think it through. In the, the history of the book to that time, 124 issues, if he'd ever caught anyone in free fall that way. I don't think so. But, you know, Robin used to push people off the edges of, you know, unfinished skyscrapers back in the 40s. We assume they died. And he was always grinning because it was just, you know, make-believe violence. It wasn't real violence. But unfortunately, I think that Peter was complicit in Gwen's death, which was only made a thing because Goblin decided that nothing mattered anymore and that he would endanger her life. Did I in any way address the question? You did. Yeah, no, that was great. I wanted to get a letterer's perspective on that snap point, and that was perfect. Thank you. And, yeah, Conway told me at that time that, yeah, there was, you know, the, his understanding from Stan, who was, you know, still in the office every day. I saw the man every day. They cannot be married. This relationship cannot go on. That's, unfortunately, she has to die, which is a really remarkable thing to have done. To, you know, let the thing go that far, because John and Stan were writing it up to about issue 100 or something. And then Roy took it over briefly before the teen, I think Conway. Well, Conway was exactly my age. So, you know, when I was 19, when I was 20, he was already writing. I think he started writing at 16. This takes us to a place where I wanted to go a minute ago. You made the trek over to Image Comics with a lot of the other Marvel folks and I guess a couple of the DC folks. And you then lettered Spawn. And how long did you letter Spawn? I'll be starting issue 281 on Tuesday. Wow. That's 281 issues that I've been involved with. You've lettered every issue of Spawn? I didn't do issue 44 because Todd wanted to set a precedent of a page rate if I weren't to be on the book. So my wife did that one. I may have ballooned at least some of it or sound affected some of it. I don't remember. But I did edit the script because that was my job at that time. As I was editing the scripts. Oh, that's great. Around that time when everyone left Marvel, did Chris Claremont leave first or did you leave first? What exactly was going on that caused you guys to leave? Chris was pushed. Bob Harris wasn't yet Marvel Letters in Chief. He was just the editor on the X-Men titles, which was about four books by then, maybe some other stuff. And Chris had been writing it for about 18 years solid. And Jim Lee was penciling by then. And I think Bob simply felt that it was time for a change. He wasn't that happy with Chris's approach in ways I'm not in a position to enumerate. That would be Chris's interview to give. It came to issue 280 of Uncanny in a manner I cannot recall, but which you could look up if you have the books. Bob didn't like the final moment, the final two or three pages of plot outcome, and told Chris that, no, it should, it should go this way instead. And Chris said, well, no, that's nonsense. I've been writing this book for 18 years. I know the characters. And Bob said, yes, but I'd like it to be this way instead. And Chris said, well, I'm not going to do that. Either Tom DeFalco or else Fabian wrote those final two or three pages. And Chris realized at that moment, oh, well, I guess this is not my book anymore. No, of course, realistically, it was not his book in the first place. He did not own it. It was not a creator-owned project. But it had been his. It was his baby for 18 years. It's, you know, old enough to go to college. And so at that point, he agreed to stay on Uncanny for about another year, I guess it might have been. You could look that up. And uh, he was then he agreed to write, I think, the first five issues of the second X-Men title. That sounds like a Tom DeFalco book, because Shooter wanted, like, Shooter didn't want to have an X-Men solo book. He felt that Wolverine was a team player. And one of the first things DeFalco did when he was in the chair was to give Wolverine a solo book. X-Men with no adjective. Chris wrote the first five, and I think it was at the, at the end of the second issue, there was introduction of a character called Omega Red, and that was Jim's character. Chris didn't know he was going to be in there. So already there were starting to be movements that were going beyond Chris's control of the book. And so Chris shrugged and said, well, okay, I'm leaving in a couple of issues anyway. And so Omega Red was in the, the character on the cover of issue three or four or something. Not a moment was missed. Chris scripted Uncanny, like, 291 or something. And then issue 292 was Scott Lobdell, and then Fabian took over the other book, or vice versa. Chris wanted kind of an all-or-nothing situation. There was a similar situation with Master of Kung Fu back around 1975 or something. It sold like gangbusters. And by the time of the fifth issue or so, it was decided there was going to be a black and white Deadly Hands of a Kung Fu magazine featuring Shang-Chi stories. And I think heart Steve's thing was, you know, he couldn't write both the monthly and the magazine monthly. And if he couldn't control the character completely, he didn't want to be involved anymore. 
So I guess Doug Mensch took over both of them at that moment because Doug could write like a thousand pages a week with no trouble. Doug is like the unsung giant of the later Bronze Age, I guess. He wrote more pages than anybody. All the principal books of DC and Marvel are nearly so. And great stuff. Master Kung Fu especially, I think, is best book. But Moon Knight is awfully good, too, as well. Then he wrote Batman for the longest time and just on and on all over the place. Doug Mensch everywhere you look. But Grant Morrison got all the props, and Don McGregor and Chris Claremont, and some of Mensch didn't get noticed. Why did you leave Marvel for Image? When Chris left, if I'd had any actual ethics of my own, I would have left at the same time in solidarity. But I figured, well, I need the gig. And so I did about five or six more months with Fabian on the one book and Scott on the other one. And with all props to those two guys, or, you know, professionals, they're both still at it. They weren't my X-Men anymore which sounds kind of childish in a way, because, you know, the Justice League changed writer and artist, and everything does after a while. Those guys were taking things in other directions, and then Scott's relationship with White Queen began, or, you know, some such thing like this, and it just... Also, it occurred to me, I was signing books for, at conventions for kids who weren't as old as my tenure on the X-Men, and I figured, okay, if, I, if he wasn't even born when I started X-Men, I've been here for long enough, and so I, you know, gave Bob Harris a call, you know, with all respect, it's, you know... I've done as many of these as I really care to. and Well, you know, good luck, good luck. And the next year came out without a break, of course. It's not as if my departure changed the publication schedule. And I figured, well, what am I going to do now? I was already lettering, you know, a ton of manga every month, which is its own interview, I guess. And who are you doing that for? Uh... Directly was for an, uh, an operation called Studio Proteus, which was a sole proprietorship, and they were packaging for Eclipse and Innovation and then Dark Horse. It was a, a two-person operation. It was Dana Lewis, who lived in Japan. In fact, she was the Newsweek bureau chief for Japan, translating like crazy for the wire services. She was translating the emperor's speeches, which, you know, gives you a sense of her place in the echelon. And she was born in Ann Arbor. She was an American stationed over there. She and Torin Smith the late Torrance Smith, there were a couple of anime and manga fans like crazy. I happened to meet at a translators club meeting in Tokyo one day when Torin was over there looking for properties for his communications. And, you know, their eyes met, they shook hands, they created this operation built Studio Proteus. And, yeah, I did Nausicaa for Viz Comics in 1989, which I lettered because I knew Torin. For Eclipse, Dirty Pair, Appleseed, Dominion, Black Magic, so many things. Ghost wow. in the Shell, later on for Dark Horse. And I was involved with all these things. How do you like manga yourself? I'm just curious, Tom. I liked working on the stuff. I've never followed it beyond the books we were producing, but it's kind of like what I was saying about Rick Lee and Artie and Arthur Adams and these guys get, getting X-Men books. The energy was just undeniable. It was incredible. Fun and giddy silliness was allowable in the manga and the anime both, just churning out manga in unbelievable amounts for a number of years. And so when I quit the X-Men, it's not as if I, had, I was destitute. But I didn't know any other editors at Marvel because I'd been the X-Men guy nonstop. And especially once I left New York, I had never made the acquaintance of anybody. And so if I had any brains, I would just, you know, called the switchboard and sitting there. Can I talk to, you know, whoever the Avengers editor was or, you know, Grunewald or Larry Hama or somebody and maybe gotten three books that day? I figured, what am I going to do now? And within about a week or two, Todd McFarlane gave me a call. And he said, yeah, he and the lads were forming this new thing called Image. And he had this property called Spawn. They had been kind of developing quietly for a while. Would I be interested in working with them? Oh, yeah. That sounds good to me. A lot of people probably don't realize that your wife and partner, as it is, is also a letter in her own right. Why don't you say a little bit about her real quick? Yeah, Lois and I go way back, about 1983. I had a way of having apprentices. When I was 25, I, I needed my first apprentice because my workload was getting to the point that it was. And I would make sure that people worked with me had a basis in calligraphy, which I guess I'd have to teach them in some cases. Kind of familiar with my graphics books, so they could keep up with me. The people who worked with me kept getting their own gigs and then moving on. I guess I taught them quite well. And so I needed someone, and then uh, a mutual friend of ours introduced me to Lois, because she'd been doing signage for science fiction conventions and things, so she was someone with the alphabet and with calligraphy. And so I put her to work. And she learned real quickly. And so when I dropped New Mutants around issue 40, maybe, because I was just overburdened, she took that over. I had a small studio called Task Force X, and that was Kevin Cunningham, who later worked for Mark Silvestri. Kevin was on staff for him. 
it was Tomoko Saito, who was a studio Proteus letterer, very good illustrator. And I'd get like three or four of us together in a room, and we'd do an issue of X-Men in a day. I'd do the copy placements, different of us would do the body copy, the script lettering, I'd do the sound effects, I'd do the balloons, I would ram the thing out rather quickly. And they all looked more or less like I did, so it was fairly seamless. But if you were to check any of the indexes for Task Force X, there's a fair number of issues. Lois and I sometimes did X-Men in tandem. I'd break it down, she'd do the dialogue, and I'd do the frilly bits on the side. She did a few things on her own with Trina Robbins. Kind of dropped away from comics. It's it's awfully demanding. It's always been awfully demanding. And not everyone's got the nerves for it. That's why things went digital in the middle 90s, just because deadlines became so utterly out of control. Talking about Trina Robbins, I just want to intrude for a second and talk about Dope, which I thought was one of your most unique and interesting lettering jobs. I, I'm a big fan of that one. Yeah, that was fun. That was for Eclipse Monthly, later 80s. And Trina always had this really clean, affectionate, and graphic approach to things. And a little 40s influence, because she was a big fan of Planet Comics and these things in the 40s, never really warmed up to the Marvel look. Fortunately, in the 80s, there were so many publishers on the scene trying to distinguish themselves from the Marvel approach altogether. The Trina was unnatural. And Sex Romer, the creator of Fu Manchu, did a novel called Dope, which is just sensationalistic nonsense about the high ups, the higher, you know, level British semi royalty, the Bertie Worcester level people, I guess. London, right. yes, perfect. So atmospheric as heck, foggy nights and, you know, dope dens and, and it ran for maybe a dozen chapters and it's finally been collected now, 25 or 30 years later. And so I got to do slightly atmospheric lettering, kind of 20s based things, something I was always fascinated by anyway. And it was a really good time because at that time, Lois and I were living in San Francisco in a building that Trina and Steve Layla Hop were on the upper flat and we were on the, the lower flat out of three flats. And so she'd just come downstairs with pages of pencils and I'd let her this and I'd walk up the stairs and drop them off and she'd ink them. I worked with her on a number of things at that time for Playboy and maybe High Times Magazine and I forget where all. Kurt Busick wrote a four-part Wonder Woman series at that time that Trina drew and Lois lettered. They'd canceled the Wonder Woman book in order to keep the copyright away from the Marston family. Otherwise, it would have reverted to them. And then George Perez's first issue came out after Trina's fourth issue. So Trina did as if the final Golden Age Wonder Woman story. Yeah, I remember that well. Because it's a standout because of the art. Completely historic because it's the first time that a woman actually drew Wonder Woman, which amazes me because I'm surprised Ramona Fredone never got a chance. Isn't that weird? You'd think, of course, DC was always very fiefdom-driven, I guess. Each editorial office was a, a completely unique entity. Unlike Marvel, where it was just kind of one big room, you know, the mythical bullpen, which never existed, but close enough. So Ramona was drawing Aquaman, I forget the name of the editor now. I would put Ramona on Superboy, instead of George Papp, who'd been drawing Green Arrow. Then Kirby would have had Green Arrow. Uh, but yeah, should have, or else I would have put her on Wonder Woman, or else I would have put Mike Sikowski on Wonder Woman. Instead of Ross Andrew, I would have put on Justice League. Yeah. <laughs> now, for you in DC, was Sovereign Seven the first, first thing you did there, or the, the thing that you did there with Claremont? Yeah, after Chris took like six months off or so from uh, the X Men ordeal. He, you know, DC says, what would you like? And so Chris created his new team book and an artist. Oh, God, really sleek style. I can't remember the fellow's name now. Beautiful work. Kind of image looking in a way, you could say. And so Chris came up with this bunch of new characters from elsewhere. And I lettered about four or five of those. And then my appendix burst. Was it was Dwayne it? Turner, wasn't it? Dwayne Turner, thank you very much. Yeah. And my appendix burst in the middle of an X-Men issue, as I think about it. I forget why I dropped Sovereign 7. I'm kind of surprised I did. But it must have been a deadline crunch. What was the transition like for you when things started going digital as far as lettering goes? Can you walk us through what the process was and how you got to that point where you decided you would go that route? Well, it was the only route in town. It was during Shooter's tenure, but you can't really blame Jim because... Marvel was just in such a massive expansion mode all the time. I forget, I've lost track of how many titles they were publishing by then, and which meant a lot of new writers, a lot of new artists. And there was just not the same discipline you got from the Sema brothers or, you know, Romita, Gil Kane, the, the previous generation of guys. And without pointing any names in particular, the new guys just weren't able to match the intensity of, like, Jack Kirby's old workload. And so things fell behind and fell behind and fell behind. 
for the Marvel sense, and I guess the DC sense, there was really no choice but to find a faster way to go, a more economical way to go. Now, I'd started doing the manga was so labor-intensive, because we'd get photostats of the Japanese artwork that still had all the Japanese dialogue and sound effects on it. And then we were flopping them backwards. They'd read um, left to right in American style instead of right to left in the Japanese style. And so we had to put new sound effects on top of the Japanese sound effects, either paint them on or paste them on. And so it was very time consuming. And in order to speed things up, Torin Smith said, well, why don't you get yourself a font design program and digitize the dialogue at least so you can spend more time on the sound effects and still make an adequate wage on this thing. And so in 1992, I got my first PC in Publishers Type Foundry, which is then the, the font design program. And it did not work with Windows as it existed at that time. And it was about a year or a year and a fraction before I actually had a workable font. So in about 93, I started hiring people to simply produce the digital output of the dialogue for me, which then had to be pasted onto the photostats. And I think it was around 95 that Richard decided he liked designing the appearance of the pages, designing the placements of things, but didn't really like doing the physical lettering. And so Comic Craft was founded. A bunch, he hired a staff of about a dozen, and they could turn a book around before lunch. You just give two pages to each person on the staff, and boom, it's all done. Which meant that suddenly the race was on to develop things faster. At the same time, between that and suddenly everyone had a motive. You could deliver the pages digitally. FedEx now overnight was too slow. So everything had to be done online instantly. By year 2000, after only about five years of the Comic Craft reality, I don't think any books were lettered by hand except Spawn, which I lettered by hand, and that was, you know, sole owner, Todd's, you know, sole thing, and Savage Dragon with Eric Larison. I don't think any mainstream books were lettered by hand anymore. By 2000, I think around 2003 or so, I gave in also because publishers' deadlines had just gotten, printers' deadlines had gotten too severe, and Spawn also was relatively off schedule because Todd's always doing way too many things, designing toys and what have you. Buying baseballs. Well, there was that, and on tour all the time. Yeah, well, the baseball thing, that's... Uh, that's cool, though, I thought. And that you was know, his fanboy passion. It's the first time that anyone recognized the fact that there were people that made that much money from comics to where they could, you know, explore their passions to such a level. Yeah, Toddy went to college on a baseball scholarship. Oh, I didn't even realize that. And he realized, in like maybe his third year, that only so many people are ever going to play pro ball but an awful lot of people draw comic books. And so he subsumed the one passion for the other one and delivered his samples to the, um, the X-Men slush pile along with 10,000 other people. Steve Englehart was needing an artist for a backup feature. He was working with Epic Illustrators, who was a creator-owned thing. He asked Dan Nocenti, who was then the X-Men editor, if he could look through her slush pile and her submissions pile. And, oh, sure, of course. And he found Toddy in there. And so Todd's first published work was... Um, in the back of an issue of Coyote. From there, he went to D.C. and did Infinity Incorporated for a while. His page layouts were really off the charts. He was unlike anybody that had come up to that point. And I still remember how his capes of characters would create the whole page format. He's always been irrepressible. He's always going to do things his way, full bore. Nothing holds him back, which is why he like upset the entire toy tie-in industry, because his toys were going to be fabulous. They were just going to be fantastically sculpted, really well painted, articulate in every way you can imagine, instead of the really cheap things that DC and Marvel were producing up to that time. Toys suddenly had to meet Todd's standard, but he wanted his issues to stand out and be unlike anyone else's, especially with Spider-Man. He figured, I want my Spider-Man to be the Spider-Man. So the webbing, the web shooter webbing suddenly looked interesting, and the intensity of the webbing over his entire costume was suddenly much more so than it had been during the previous artists after Ditko. And texture became Todd's thing. You know, backgrounds, big uh, contorted body shapes when he's swinging through the city, more of a Ditko style. Yeah, Todd's an amazing fellow. And that brings us to phase two of our interview with you today, Tom. And that means it's time for our two registered fanboys, Jim and Alex, to ask you a few questions, and they're chomping at the bit. I can just tell because I see them via video, and I'm going to let Alex start this round. Alex, what do you have to ask Tom? 
Tom, I love all the insight you've given us today. You had mentioned Jim Shooter and the editorial direction of killing Jean Grey for the genocide of the asparagus planet. (laughs) Was that the only time he gave any editorial directorship? Or do you feel like you guys didn't have to deal with too much control on the X-Men book? You know, as time went on, Chris had a pretty good sense what his editors wanted to see, I, I've no doubt there were massive struggles, like, you know, arm wrestling, wrestling on the floor struggles. <laughs> Partly because Chris's stories often didn't really seem to conclude. So, but then again, life often doesn't seem to conclude either. Things just kind of drift away and become focused later on, perhaps. But, you know, as things went into the five issue format for sake of the reprints, I think that was another thing he was chafing up against Chris was. Shooter. He was a realist. He had his own sense of how things ought to be done. You know, he and Frank Miller had some notorious battles, but Jim was editor-in-chief. You know, someone's got to be in charge. It isn't just, you know, a free-for-all. As far as I'm aware, though, that was the only time that Jim really stepped in and said, you know, Chris, this, your logic is flawed in relation to what I think is a more sensible, larger view of Marvel as a publishing entity, as a profit-making entity. You know, Chris and I were in touch quite a bit in those days. Sometimes he'd stay out in San Francisco for a week or so with us. I I can't think of any other time offhand. Mm -hmm. Okay. Another question, how the corporate guys could kind of drive Jim Shooter kind of crazy. Yeah, it was Shooter's thing, because, you know, Jim Shooter, the good and the bad, was that, and he did a lot of good. Uh, He increased the company's fortunes enormously because he was being pushed constantly from upstairs from the money guys to simply make more and more and more money every year, which made him kind of crazier. I gotcha. Were you doing most of your lettering from California most of that time? Oh, yeah. I was out there from, oh, gosh, 81 until like 2005 and then out to Portland. So I was back in New York for three and a half years from 78 to 81. And then didn't really look back. Okay, so most of the lettering was all from California after 1981. Yeah, but by then, as I say, everyone had a modem emailed across. Uh, Oh, sometimes six days a week between X-Men, New Mutants, Wolverine, maybe What If. I forget what else I was doing by that time. Star Wars for a while, Spider-Woman for a while. When you were lettering those newer comics from Chris, X-Men Forever and New Mutants Forever... Did it feel like old times? How was that? Oh, it utterly, especially X-Men Forever. That was absolutely old times. I was like suddenly 15 years younger. The book didn't last forever, unfortunately. It ran about a year and a half. A bi-weekly, Chris had an arrangement with Marvel that would give him two books a month. That way there'd be like a constant stream of X-Men of his style. X-Men Forever picked up the moment that he left Marvel in 1992. So the Avengers team was the 1992 team, and Chris had to figure out, okay, well, how can I make this, meanwhile, different from 1992 without in any way conflicting with X-Men as it is today in, like, 2010, whatever that was, 2015. So he made some remarkable changes to the lineup almost immediately. And I figured, yes, it's, everyone sounds like themselves. Kitty sounds like Kitty, and Gambit sounds like Gambit. It was lovely, and I was hoping it would go on forever. Also because they put my name on the cover. Not necessarily the first time that it happened, but it might have been the first time at Marvel. And I love uh, reading Chris Claremont's stuff. I like how he puts a lot of explanation in things. Did you ever feel like, whoa, that's a number, that's a lot of letters for this page? Did that ever come up? It was a lot of letters. Fortunately, I've got a light enough grip on the pen that I was never getting cramps. I've known people that started to get carpal tunnel syndrome after just a few years professionally because their grip was too tight. Part of, I guess, calligraphy training is you hold a much more of a featherweight on the pen staff. Chris's style involved typing back when it was, you know, in analog for, format, I guess you'd call it physical format. Kid write on 8.5 by 14 paper instead of 8.5 by 11. They were the top seller in the line, more than FF, more than the, the flagship titles. Like toward the later 80s, it was selling between a half and three quarters of a million copies in issue. So when people said, oh, it's crap, you know, they should fire Claremont, it's just terrible, why do they keep letting him write this stuff? Everybody was buying it. And it wasn't for its collectability necessarily, because it was as if it was being drawn by, you know, Frazetta or someone that would be immediately slabbed. Uh, Smitty was good, Romita Jr. was good, Leonardi, you know, a lot of very good people on there. But it was kind of X-Men as usual. But it kept selling, and the consistent point was Chris's writing. So people can say, oh, it was all downhill after Byrne left. But the sales continued to climb. Jim, 
I have four questions. Tom, my, my first question would be, for a lot of fanboys, you can open up a book and recognize the artist or the inker almost immediately. I can do it usually by a single panel or so. In terms of letters, I've never been that good at it. How would I recognize your lettering versus somebody else's upon opening a single page of an X-Men comic? Oh, I don't know. Comment was earlier about the sound effects I'd have just blasting all over the page. I, since I've been on the book through four editors in chief and about literally 10 editors, and I don't know how many assistant editors, they just let me do anything I wanted, and Chris let me do anything I wanted. So I would add sound effects when I felt they were necessary. I'm nothing compared to Ken Brusenak, who lives for Howard Chaikin all the time. He'll dominate an entire page with interesting sound effects. And I think my strongest point is in my work, which doesn't exactly deflect your question, is my copy placements, is deciding where the script goes on the pages. Because I approach it like Ella Fitzgerald, kind of like bebop singing, where I interplay with all the elements on the page instead of putting stuff at the tops of the panels and the bottoms of the panels. If everything has equal priority on the page, the hair, the dialogue, the captions, the fists, the capes, you kind of do a triage. Which thing can we afford to sacrifice so that everything reads in the proper order? Because the characters don't always speak in the order in which the artist has drawn them. So you have to kind of, you know, syncopate throughout the page. And I think that's what I bring to it. Neither your jazz sensibility will bring you simpatico with me, or else it's really too arcane and doesn't make any sense at all. I always liked your tight style, uh, tight and smaller, like your dialogue style, because you would give more room then to the sound effects and to the power of the page. The question that can ever be answered is whether Chris wrote so much because I could always make it fit, or whether I worked small because there was so much that had to fit. I think you answered my question exactly. That's the next question I had for you was in terms of instruments. I know artists have their own favorite instruments. In in terms of letters, are there different ones and what were yours? Of course, in present day, we're all working with, you know, Adobe Illustrator on Mac. Right. At that time, most, though not all, were working with speedball nibs and pen staffs. We honed them down on a knife sharpening stone, which is, I think, John Romita showed me how to do that. Some people used regular quill pens. John Costanza had honed his pen down. It was a, a crow quill pen to the point where he could do the dialogue. This is the regular weight and the bold weight with the same pen. Whoa. He would just alter the grip slightly. I always had to use two different pens to get a bold weight versus a regular weight. But yeah, Speedball, which are still available in well-stocked art supply stores, they're 40 cents a nib when I started. Now they're about like two and a quarter. What was the difference between working in with a full script and working in Marvel Method for you as a letterer? Mm, well, again, we're talking about working by hand. It was, there was no difference. If there was one artist that you would have liked to have gotten to letter for that you never had that opportunity, who would it have been? I think I worked with everybody. I never let him Maurice Severin. That would have been fun. What about Alex Toth? Well, he always did his own. I would have Yeah, I know. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, I would have detracted. In terms of your influences, and you talk about Artie Semic, but both in terms of letters that preceded you, but also other influences, what were the ones that you think are most significant to how you approached it? Yeah, I had a few, a few keynote kind of aha moments. Certainly, once Stan started giving credits to Simic and Rosen and everyone else on the teams, I started to see that, oh yeah, Simic is the one that's more like a draftsman, and Rosen is a little wackier. Uh, they were both influential in their different ways, but seeing Zap comics only like four or five years into the Marvel age of things, it's like, holy smoke, you can do anything. So now it's a matter of understanding what anything means, what are the parameters of anything. A bit later, I started recognizing Gaspar Celadino's work on all Julia Schwartz's books at DC. So, you know, Justice League, Adam Hawkman, Adam Strange, Atomic Knights, these things. Peerless title designer. Once I became where he was lettering the covers after 1968, you know, wow, this guy is, he is the best there will ever be. I mean, you know, all respect to Todd Klein and John Workman and Mike Heisler and everyone that's come up since. There's no touching Gaspar. Irish Schnapp was very doctrinaire and very much a draftsman. And extremely good. But Gaspar, rest his soul, he was a true crazy man, a true, he was the, the best ultimate designer that we will ever see in this field, especially now that everything has gone to digital. So how was it that he was doing page one of, of the X-Men comics? He was doing page one of all the Marvel comics after about 72 for two or three years. Or ah. Nearly, yeah, uh, Simic 
had um, died, Rosen had retired, and then there's suddenly a dozen new people like me who didn't know much about anything about doing attractive title display work for a splash page. And so John Verporten, who was then the production boss, gave Gaspar a call and said, you know, we need title pages only. You won't be credited, but we'll give you... I was getting five bucks a page. He was getting 15 for the title designs. And, oh, that's fascinating. I didn't realize that. Yeah, they just wanted to have a consistently attractive look on the splash pages. And I realized after about six months, you know, I could use that extra five bucks an issue. It's more than nothing. And so after about my fourth book or so, fifth book, and I was doing an issue of something called Unknown Worlds of Science Fiction, John Buscema's Pencils. Giordano inked it. My gosh, what am I doing in that league? I'm only a few months into the office. I figured, I'd better get good, so I won't detract from the appearance of these guys' work. As I was saying to your other question, it's, you know, that kind of self-consciousness kicked in. I worked on Ditko's pencils. I worked, you know, Gil Kane, Infantino. You know, there's my entire adolescence of pencilers, a great deal of it. I never worked on Kurt Swan. That would have been something. Now, I had read somewhere that the Flash Gordon newspaper strip was something that you enjoyed and had some influence on you creatively. Is that a correct thing? Oh, yeah, yeah. The, the Alex Raymond stuff, the 30s stuff. When I was about... 15, 16 of my first cons, an outfit called Nostalgia Press, run by the late Woody Gelman, published first a hardcover. And so when I was 15, yeah, you know, I, I should look as good as that. And well, that was not possible, but it was something to strive for. And it didn't look like Marvel Comics, which sent me to the side of the Marvel doctrinaire discipline, kind of, which is kind of based on probably Sam Rosen and then John Costanza as we got into 1970. And I never looked anything like that, but no one said I should. There was no marble style sheet, which kind of surprises me after all this time. That's cool that Gaspar Saladino did that first page for a lot of the new letterers. It sounds like when people would join Marvel and go off of the Kirby or Buscema layouts, it sounds like it's a similar concept. Oh, yeah, very much so. I finally met Gaspar. He, he did one convention in his life about, I think it was New York Comic Con perhaps three years ago now. He was 88. He was kind of infirm by then. He's, he's died since then. But his son-in-law, I had him in a wheelchair, I just kind of take him around. And, you know, the word got out to Todd Klein, who was acquainted with the man, and then myself, and just all the way down the line. So Janice Chang was there, and Iliopolis was there, and it's like, you know, a dozen supplicants just kneeling in front of him and weeping, because it's Gaspar Saladino. It's, wow, it's the grandest. I'm talking to Alex Rand, but anyway. <laughs> if you look back with informed eyes, you can see he was lettering their top books. He was lettering Superman to the 40s, all the dialogue. Offhand, I can't recall what all, but, you know, looking through the archives and the essentials and whatever these formats are called these days. The best work was his, the best dialogue styles, all through action comics and detectives and the backups and the lead stories. There he is on the, the, the daily and Sunday strips in the 40s. There he was. Gasper? No, no, Ira. Ira, Ira, that's what I thought. I wasn't sure. Yeah. And okay. lettering the covers up until about 1967 or so. And then suddenly this rapid succession, actually kind of gradual, but suddenly they were all Gaspar. Very different approach, but Carmine wanted more crackle in there, and Ira's stuff had gotten kind of the same. His 40s and 50s cover lettering, though, was incredible. Well, it's, it's kind of sad like because it, right after he was put out to pasture, about six months later, he dropped dead. And yeah. a lot of people think it's because he lost the direction of his life by being kind of forced out. Well, that happens to people who retire from General Motors, too. I mean, you know, you sure. used to be on the line, and then that there's a break in the continuity. There's no more the physical activity. Neil told me, because I worked at continuity for a while, but I rented space. I didn't actually work in the, the continuity of reality. But, you know, Neil likes to spin stories because he met everybody. You should interview him. But he said to Ira, you know, you know, Ira, you're an old man. You should take some time off, and his hands would tremble a bit. But give him a pen staff and a drawing table, and he was rock solid because he was focusing on the pen. He was focusing on the outcome. And I'm sure that'll be true of all of us. You know, one of these days, you know, we're made a junior, we're made a senior. Alex Toth died at his drawing table. A, a good death. Bill right. Everett finished his last issue of Submariner, then he died. But he finished the issue. <laughs> That's amazing. And it, it's a testament to how great these guys were, what they did, and their output, and how classic it is to this day. You know, we're talking about Michelangelo or Leonardo da Vinci because we're such fanboys ourselves. But these were the works that really changed our lives in many ways, I think, if I can speak for the rest of y'all. This brings us to what's arguably the funnest portion of our podcast, and that would be 
the weekly rant. And we're going to start with our guest star, Tom. And Tom, do you have anything to rant about, good or bad, about comics and these years that you've been in the industry? I think comics are just so wonderful because they are kind of adjunct our lives. They allow us to kind of shake off our inhibitions. There's an indie comics. Well, I'm, I think every principal city and every second every city has an independent comics con at least once a year. There's one here in town called Genghis Khan. <laughs> it's run by a fellow who does <laughs> posters for bands, for clubs, for a local sandwich shop, which has like five locations. And they create a new sandwich every month as a special. He does a special poster for that. He does, you know, send T-shirts for local cinemas. Wonderful guy. And Genghis Khan gets vendors out, but from New York State, someone who was just here from Southern California, from all the four or five surrounding states. And the energy in that room is just fantastic. No one's drawing costume heroes. People are just doing their whimsy. They're doing the adventures that they think are valuable. They're doing personal stories about surviving, you know, cancer or what have you. And comics. Unfortunately, in the last 50 years, has been costumes for the most part. But go to a comic shop, and an awful lot of them have no costumes. You could argue that Harley Quinn wears a costume, but not really. It's difficult to say. There's talk of Marvel cutting back from publishing monthly books in favor of just trade paperbacks, and maybe this will happen, maybe it won't. But people like to produce comics. That's the most amazing thing to me, is the prices get out of the control, and no one can really make a living if they're doing indies. They want to do them anyway. It's just so wonderful to see that people have not given up that desire to do comics, even when they know they don't have a snowball's chance of getting to DC and Marvel, because they don't want to do DC and Marvel. They just want to do fun stories and have a good time and work with other people and meet other people. And truly, that's that's where I came in, doing zines when I was 15 and 16. We didn't know we were going to be working in Iron Man inside of you know four or five years. We just wanted to do adventure stories, Edgar Rice Burroughs adventure-type stories, so... Hey, comics. That brings us to your rant, Jim. What do you have to rant about this week? Mine is not going to be yay comics at the moment because <laughs> I am I am pissed off, to be honest. <laughs> Mine is there. about Comic Con. This this would have been my San Diego, but I could just say Comic Con now because no one else is allowed to use the word Comic Con except San Diego because of the recent uh, court decision. But Comic Con pissed me off. I have been going for, I believe, 24 years in a row. I'm going to go this year, but I'm not going to go with my regular badge as a fan because I could not get a ticket this year. The notion that it's become such an ordeal that I couldn't actually get a regular badge this year is, to me, the opposite of what fandom is supposed to be. And I'm mad about it. (laughs) And I'm mad about the judicial decision that said that that no one else can actually be a Comic-Con. I think we go to Comic-Cons all the time, and I it reminds me of Disney trying to control words as well. It's it's the same part of the same problem. So that's my rant, and I am pissed off. And that brings us to Alex. Alex, you seem a little, like, bemused by the entire thing, but how do you feel this week, and what's your rant? Well, you know, we all read a lot of different comics as time goes on, but... I've been appreciating Chester Gould in circa 1935 for Dick Tracy comic strips. I love the earlier stuff too, but as I'm getting into his 1935-1936 phase, I'm loving the way the art is looking. There's almost a Dick Sprang quality to it, 10 to 15 years before Dick Sprang was doing Batman. And there's that fun, slick, cartoony visual style to the strips that I've been getting through this past weekend. It's true, he is not an Alex Raymond artist on a Sunday, but I will say, I love the stories, I love how he pays tribute, I don't know if it's paying tribute or just illustrating how infamous some famous criminals are, like the Ma Barker group, Al Capone, John Dillinger, Bonnie and Clyde, I just love that he inserts those characters into the 30 strips, I love the quality of art that feels like Dick Sprang, before there was a Dick Sprang. And I wanted to highlight that, and if anyone out there hasn't had a chance to look at it, I highly suggest it. It's really fabulous. And nobody did a midget and a plus-size gal justice like he did. (laughs) Let's just spell short backwards. That's his name. You know, Jerome Troes, that's his name. So 
That brings me to my rant. And yes, I have another Yay Comics rant myself. But mine is a love letter, per se, to all of our fans. And yes, we have a few out there. And I'd like to thank you guys for listening to us. And I'd like to thank you for making it possible for us to get to the point where we could have a major guest like Tom with us today. The wonderful thing about podcasts is, is it adds to the entire love of comics for me. I know it does for Alex and Jim. Uh, I've done more in comics and video game production. But I have to say, I have enjoyed working with you guys so much on these podcasts. It gives a new dimension to our love of comics, I think. And it gives us a way to tell people what that is. If they don't get to cons, if they don't, they might be shut-ins. They might be people that have kids and can't get out as much as they'd like to. But I'd like to say, hooray for podcasts. We do have a following, and I want to thank you guys that are listening to us today. And I, most of all, today I'd like to thank Tom Morzikowski. Tom, it's been a supreme honor for me, and it's been so much fun. And we've been friends for at least five years on Facebook but to get to talk to you face-to-face, as it were, because we can see each other, it's been great. And I'll let Alex and Jim have an outro moment with you themselves, because I know they probably feel similar to how I feel. Alex? Well, I grew up reading those X-Men comics that you were a part of, so it's a huge treat for me. And also, I love the comments and your historical insights in the Comic Book Historian Facebook group. And you've always been really just a real gem as far as your knowledge in the industry, of the arts, of just comic book history in general. It's been a real treat for me personally. This brings us to the man who always tries to get a word up on me, and that would be you, Jim Thompson. What do you have to say? Well, Bill, I just want to say that your rant was very nice. Spent my your birthday yesterday not getting a badge, so I'm I'm mad. But Tom, <laughs> that aside, it has been really, really great for having you. I always appreciate your breadth of your knowledge because you do add things and you add insight to it, and it's great fun to have you as a member on Comic Book Historians. It makes our job more rewarding to have people like you at knowing that you're actually, we're doing something right, where you're actually following and participating mm-hmm. with us. I can't say what a joy that is when someone like you says, oh, that's a nice horse, or responds to something. It's great, and we appreciate it, and this has been really fun, and thank you. It's us being part of a community of people that care this passionately about this kind of silly stuff. 